Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at enzyme inhibition, competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors, comparing enzyme inhibitors, end product inhibition, and then we'll finish with a summary. So enzymes can be activated by various different cofactors, which are important molecules that bind to the enzyme and help its function. So to illustrate this, we've got an enzyme here, and if this combines with a cofactor, which a lot of enzymes do, often the cofactor is needed to complete the enzyme structure or aid it in functioning, making it better. And then at this point, the substrate can bind and the reaction can proceed appropriately. But actually other molecules can bind to enzymes too, and they can be deactivated by molecules known as inhibitors. So an inhibitor is any molecule which reduces or stops a reaction from happening. So it's a blockade basically. So if you add even just a small concentration of an inhibitor to an enzyme solution, it reduces the rate of reaction quite significantly. So if we had a progress of reaction along the bottom, and we had the rate of reaction here, at this point, if we add an inhibitor, it really reduces the reaction quite a lot, because you can see it quickly drops down to another level. If we add the inhibitor in excess, so lots and lots of inhibitor molecules, into the solution, then the reaction basically comes to a stop and is prevented completely. So with the same graph, looking at time and rate of reaction here, if we add excess inhibitor, then the reaction drops right down to zero and it basically stops. So it can be a very powerful molecule. And there are different types of inhibitors. So one type of inhibitor is known as a competitive inhibitor. And it's competitive because of its nature in competing with the substrate, which will become clear in just a moment. The competitive inhibitor is one that fits into the active site of the enzyme, just like the substrate does, but instead of the substrate. So often it's very similar structure to the substrate in that it can fit to the active site, but often it's slightly different in its chemical structure. So here we have an enzyme and the substrate normally fits perfectly into the active site. But if we add a competitive inhibitor, it can also fit in due to its shape. And if the competitive inhibitor does go into the active site, it makes a physical barrier or a block preventing the formation of the enzyme substrate complexes. So imagine the competitor's gone into the active site. It's now taken up this space where the substrate wants to go. So the substrate can now not get in because it's being blocked by the competitive inhibitor. So it inhibits this reaction from happening in that way. So because both inhibitor and the substrate fits into the active site, they compete with each other for the enzyme. So they're both trying to achieve the same bonding in that active site, both the competitor and the substrate. So it's a competition, and hence the name competitive inhibitor. The other type of inhibitor we can have is a non-competitive inhibitor. Make sure you don't call it uncompetitive, because it is called a non-competitive. So non-competitive don't compete with the substrate. So non-competitive inhibitors bind to a different part of the enzyme, and this is called the allosteric site. So it's not the active site this time. So this is our non-competitive inhibitor in the green, and we have our enzyme over here and it binds into this site here, and the active site is over here. There can be multiple different sites on an enzyme, the active site where the actual reaction happens, and that's where a competitive inhibitor would bind, but a non-competitive inhibitor binds a different site called the allosteric site, and usually this is far away from the active site on the structure of the protein. So the non-competitive inhibitor binds into this site, and when it does, it interacts with chemical groups causing a conformational change in the enzyme. And the conformational change usually goes to the active site. So we've got the non-competitive inhibitor binding into its allosteric site. And at this allosteric site, there are certain chemical interactions between this inhibitor and the enzyme. And these get transferred through the enzyme. And it changes the shape slightly. And you can see that it's changing the shape of the active site. So conformational change refers to a shape change. And because there's a shape change, we've got an altered shape of the enzyme's active site. And now it's no longer complementary with the substrate that it's supposed to bind. So these chemical changes have altered the active site to a point where now the substrate that should fit into the enzyme can't properly fit. And so the reaction again is inhibited. Because these inhibitors don't bind to the active site, they don't compete with the substrates. They simply win by binding somewhere else. So they're not competitive, hence the name non-competitive whereas a competitive inhibitor would go at the same site as the substrate. Because there are two different types of inhibitors, they produce different results when we consider how the reaction progresses. 
Competitive and non-competitive inhibitors work in different ways. As we've already seen, they bind at different sites, and they inhibit reactions, therefore, in different ways. This one creates a physical block, and the non-competitive inhibitor creates chemical changes indirectly. Non-competitive inhibitors are very powerful, and they can inhibit something very strongly. So if we were to have substrate concentration down on the x-axis, and initial rate of reaction on the y-axis, where usually when you increase the substrate concentration, your rate of reaction goes up because there are more substrates to react and make products with. If you were to do this same thing, but this time have an inhibitor present in all of your measurements, you get this constant line where as you add substrate concentration, it doesn't increase the rate because it's so powerful, it's blocked it to this level. So the non-competitive inhibitors are very strong. Competitive inhibitors are still able to inhibit, but they're less powerful than non-competitors. So here we have, again, substrate concentration, and we will have initial rate of reaction on this side. And again, as you increase substrate, you increase the rate of reaction, the normal red line. If we now add a competitive inhibitor, for every given substrate concentration, the rate is lower. But as you keep increasing substrate concentration, it still does come back up to a normal level. So it's still inhibiting, but it's less powerful than non-competitive. If we have a graph of both inhibitor types, you can see the comparison. So let's have the same graph again, but with all of the lines together. Substrate concentration on the x-axis, and initial rate of reaction on the y-axis. This is with no inhibitors at all. The green line represents competitive inhibition, and the red line represents non-competitive inhibition. So you can see that the non-competitive one brings the rate down a lot more than the competitive one for a given substrate concentration. And eventually there comes a point where it really does plateau off and increasing the substrate concentration doesn't help anymore, whereas normally it would for a little bit longer. When we're talking about competitive inhibitors, they tend to bind reversibly. So when the competitive inhibitors come in and they bind to the active site, they are allowed to leave again, and often they're sort of flipping in and out randomly. But non-competitive inhibitors bind permanently. So once they've bound to their allosteric site, that's it, they're stuck in place, and those chemical changes are permanently done. So this table just summarizes a few features of both of these types of inhibitors. So for a competitive inhibitor, it binds at the active site, it binds reversibly, and the inhibition is quite weak. For a non-competitive inhibitor, it binds at the allosteric site, it's normally permanent, and the inhibition is strong. We've already seen how enzymes can work together to complete metabolic processes. For example, when the product of one reaction, i.e. if we add this substrate to this enzyme, we get the product of this rectangle, this product can go and be the substrate for the next reaction. And there can be multiple step reactions where they use the previous product as the substrate for the next reaction. And this is used in metabolic pathways like the Calvin cycle or the Krebs cycle, for example. But there's another type of inhibition we need to be aware of called end product inhibition. A lot of the time, when a cell is doing a reaction, it only wants a certain amount of molecule being produced. So when we're making particular molecules, whether that be something in respiration or something in making muscles contract, it doesn't want to overproduce and it doesn't want to underproduce. It's got to make the right level of any chemical. This could be for a number of reasons. If you make too much of something, it can be very dangerous. It can harm proteins. It can change the pH. If you don't produce enough, for example, ATP, you may end up starving the cell of energy. So any chemical that is made in an enzyme-controlled reaction needs to be controlled, and they only want a certain amount of this chemical. So in this case, what they can do is use one of the products as an inhibitor in itself to another enzyme in the pathway. So for example, if we use this substrate in this enzyme to make this product the yellow square, the yellow square can go back and inhibit one of the enzymes to stop it making so much of this. And in this situation, if the inhibitor is non-competitive, i.e. binds to an allosteric site, and the last product in the pathway, it's called end product inhibition. So what this is explaining is that you have a pathway making a particular molecule say a multi-step pathway leading to the formation of this yellow square. This is our end product. You could use it to be, for example, ATP if you'd like to. We want a certain amount of ATP. What this ATP can do is go backwards 
and inhibit enzymes which make it itself, almost like it's going back in time and stopping itself from being made. So it goes to the enzyme that helps to make ATP and it binds to this allosteric site and it acts as a non-competitive inhibitor. So that means that no more of it gets made. So it's almost like it's at the front of the queue and it's telling everyone behind to stop because we've got enough. So what happens is the concentration of the final product might start getting high. So we're making lots of this yellow square. As it builds up, it's then going to act and create more inhibition on those other enzymes. So let's look at a pathway. We've got green triangles becoming the rectangles, the squiggly shape, and then this final product. So this is our end product. It's an important, useful molecule that we like, but we don't want to have too much of it. If these steps are happening loads and loads and loads, then we're going to get lots of this product. And we want to stop this because if we have too many, it's going to be a problem. So the product itself goes and acts back on this first stage enzyme and it inhibits this enzyme from doing that first step non-competitively. So then this stops happening and this won't get made anymore. So it's stopping the cell from going too far. And then greater inhibition will lead to a decrease in the amount of this end product being made. So as it goes back and inhibits this, this doesn't happen, and all of the steps after it don't get to happen either. They'll still continue with what they've got left, but they will eventually slow down, and the amount of the end product being produced will run out, or go down. And then eventually, of course, we'll go in the other direction. If the concentration of the end product keeps going down, then the inhibition decreases, because it's now not able to carry out this end product inhibition. So because this has been inhibiting itself, this has now been falling, and because this is falling, the inhibition is going to fall, and then the enzyme will become reactivated again, and it can carry out the stages again, and then start making it. So hopefully you can appreciate that as it gets too high, it will be brought back down, but as it gets brought back down, it will be made high again. So it's kind of controlling itself and controlling the levels by looking back on the conveyor belt and saying, we need more, we need less. So it's actually a really clear example of negative feedback or a negative feedback loop. So actually, this is a really clear example of negative feedback or a negative feedback loop, meaning that the concentration of a product stays roughly constant. So you can imagine that through time, the concentration of this product, that yellow square which we were talking about, so initially, the concentration of the product will keep going up, and then at a certain point, it will start causing this end product inhibition. And then, as it inhibits itself from being made, it will come back down, and the concentration will remain a nice normal level. If it ever drops too low, as it will do because of this inhibition, the inhibition stops because it's now no longer able to inhibit itself and the concentration goes back up again. So over time it kind of oscillates between being too high and too low, but overall stays at a nice constant level. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.